I, I want to introduce the absolute best boss I've ever had. Um, I've had a number of people I've worked for in my life. And, um, I've been very privileged to have worked uh, with Dr. Miles Anderson. So I want to welcome him up here today and just give him a round of applause. I appreciate oh. it. How nice. Thank you, Tim, very, very much. It's uh, grand for me to be here, to be in the face of these new students. So it's uh, a delight for me to be with you today. I'm going to tell you some stories today about the history of winemaking at Wall Wall. And I'm going to be going rather rapidly at times because we only have about an hour or so to do this. In addition to that, we're tasting five wines from five iconic wineries. And the gag factor on these wines are very, very low. <laughs> And so these wines here that are in front of you are world-class wines made by world-class winemakers. Some of those people you're going to meet, some of those people you may not meet, but you're certainly going to enjoy them through their wines. And so this particular valley has a very rich and rather lengthy history, uh, surprisingly, to a, many, a lot of people. Here we go. We're going to do this rather rapidly. We could go back to 18, in the 1850s, we were making wine in Walla Walla. And the reason why we were making wine here is because the French Canadians arrived. And remember, French is before Canadian. So wherever the French hold out, they've got to have some wine. And so, we had uh, some wines that were being developed here in Walla Walla. And this particular one that Roberts had uh, is uh, very, very close to the Baker Boyer Bank. So if you know where the Baker Boyer Bank is on Main and Second, you'll know approximately where that might have been. Then 1861, Ritz started a nursery and planted a vineyard with 21 varieties of of wines. And so it goes back pretty far. And with the discovery of gold in Idaho in the 1870s, Walla Walla became a supply post for the mining industry. And A.B. Roberts advertised that he had 50 tons of grapes for sale. Write this down. One ton of grape will make 64 cases of finished wine. So now, multiply, do some arithmetic. And you can find out how many finished bottles of wine were for sale. Barcelli, which is probably the most famous winemaker in Walla Walla, in 1876, he made 2,500 cases of wine. And he made them from Muscat and Black Prince and Concord Prince. And he also had a baker. He had a baker. And this one was also across the street from the Baker Boyer Bay, uh, and where it's located today. And Frank made a lot of good wine. Sabrina. Black Prince, what is it today? Oh, Island Bell? Is that it? Not quite. Oh, Close. okay. Sinso. Sinso. Oh, man! Sinso. Taking the school. So, Sinso, <laughs> and we have, we have, there's still a real, real, real old crop of this particular wine off of Risha Road, very close to the high school. The vines are on the left-hand side, looking south. And the vines have been there probably 75 years. And no one claims them. Frenchtown is where Le Col 41 is located on Highway 12. And Frenchtown had a lot of wineries there. And... Um, John Marie made some wine there, and, um, and it was, they made them from 
in addition to Muscat, but they also made it from Samsung. Let's go further. 1882, there were 26 saloons in Walla Walla for a population of 4,000. <laughs> Divide 26 into 4,000. <laughs> so, um, alcohol was a very, very important thing. Then in 1883 and 1884, there were decreases. Deep freezes are things where it is minus 20 degrees below zero. Write it down. On the average, every six years in Walla Walla, there is a deep freeze. So if you're planning to do a winery or, and or a vineyard, you need to crank that in your business plan. Because that means all your grapes are gone. And also, asterisk, 10% of all of the grapes that you will grow will be lost during frost in Walla Walla every year. And sometimes a tad more depending upon where you're located. So what I just told you goes back to 1883. Prohibition began in Washington State in 1917. There was an anti-saloon league here. And so you no longer could purchase alcohol. But you could make so they passed a law allowing you to have 200 gallons of wine a month that you could make yourself at home. One residence. So if you ganged up and said, there are four of us that are going to make wine, so we're going to do 800 gallons. No, 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 no. 200 per resident per property. Okay? So if you plan to make homemade wine, what you want to make sure is that the, as soon as you designate it as wine, it's more than 200 gallons, you must take it somewhere else. So that's very, very important to do. Therefore, Walla Walla, because it had so many Italians at that particular time, particularly Southern Italians and Northern Italians, they needed wine and they made their own, and they had their own little backyard vineyards. And in some cases, they still do. In addition to that, they also distilled wine and called it grappa. And some are still doing that today. The Southern Italians are the ones that do the grappa, principally. The Northern Italians arrived first and the Northern Italians came to Walla Walla. They were principally from a town outside of Florence, Italy, called Luca. And next to Luca, there was a little town called Lucarelli. So there are Italians here whose last name are Luca and Lucarelli. The Southern Italians came from Calabria much later. And they came principally from Calgary, Canada because that's where they landed in North America, and then they came down to Walla Walla. And therefore, many of the marriages that took place very early in Walla Walla were arranged. So the women were chosen by a particular person or family and sent to Walla Walla. And you met her for the first time at the railroad station down on Second Avenue, and hopefully it would work. Blind dating, they called it in those days. <laughs> okay, starting after Prohibition, Zinfandel was made by Italian families in Walla Walla. The Zinfandel was grown in California, and it was transported here by railway to the depot on Second Avenue. 
And if you were a, a winemaker, you would order how much you wanted. And you would go down there and pick it up. And they would put them in small totes. And the totes are about the size that you see that are used to pick asparagus today. And you would take it home and make wine. And sometimes there were two or three or four of you that would do it. You would buy someone's truck and go get it. And so the Walla Walla Gardeners Association was the one that arranged all of that for you, which no longer exists today. It closed two years ago. Many of the Italians would get the tote of grapes and put it on their back porch and let those grapes dry for about two or three months. And then they would make wine from the dry grapes, rupasa, which was a very, very rich port flavored kind of wine. And today if you buy it, it's very, very expensive. It's kind of like Amarone. So the next time you have a glass of Amarone, think of the Italians in Walla Walla that were making wine that way. <coughs> and then they would have caves in the backyard and they would do two things there. Or I should say they would store, they would do two things. They stored grappa and that was not legal because remember this is prohibition. And they also stored wine there. The wine they stored there was the best wine they made. So if you came over for dinner tonight and you weren't my best friend, you would get wine from the house, not from the cave. The stuff in the cave with which it preserved was very, very special to it. And of course the local priest was one of the special people. <laughs> yeah. But they wanted to avoid detection because there were liquor agents in and around Walla Walla all the time. One of the unfortunate things that happened when they made the wine is they did not use sulfites. And you'll learn a lot about that in the coming weeks. They didn't use sulfites. So they put wine in the barrels without sulfites. So for the first month, the wine was pretty damn good. But they would keep siphoning it off with pitchers. They bring the pitchers into the house, fill up their glasses. By December, it became a good vinaigrette for salads because it gained more and more volatile acidity as it stayed in those barrels. And then the volatile acidity would penetrate the barrels and then next year, when they put wine back in the barrels, it automatically got a lot of VA. And then inside the barrels, the barrels, and if you put your finger in the bunghole, in the belt around the top, it would be very spongy. In Italy today, there are many, many families there that make wine, and, it's in, and their barrels are identical to my current description. So when you go to their house, and I have gone to their houses and had wine there, and you would taste it, and you're not quite sure if you could either spit this or swallow it. Spitting was the thing you needed to do. So you wanted to know if there was a restroom nearby. So you could pol politely get rid of it. Because the wine was pretty, pretty acidic, pretty awful. A lot of fun though. Here we go. <clears throat> Grappa was made, we talked about that. Um, grapes from, for the homemade winemaker in Walla Walla came from Marysville, Sunnyside, and Stretch Island. And it was in Stretch Island that the Island Bell grape was created purposely for that community on that island to grow the grapes and to make wine. 
but you can still get some of that. Frank Sabuco had uh, 36 acres of vineyard containing those. And uh, there are some people that I have met who have tasted some of Frank's wines. They said it wasn't bad, but I wouldn't buy it. Now, the first commercial winery in Walla Walla Valley after Prohibition was started by Bert Estiallo. Lived on Sunnyside Road in Milton Freewater. Um, he made wine from Black Prince, Muscatel, and Concord Grapes. And he had the Blue Mountain Cellars label. He grew his own grapes. And in 1955, we had one of these deadly freezes. He lost all of the grapes. And he got so tired of replanting his vineyard, he gave up. He died about five years ago. His wife died about three years ago. He was in his 90s. His son still is there on the same property. And Rick Small of Woodward Canyon bought all of his winemaking equipment and still has it. So someday we'll put it on display. Uh, we tried to get him to come and teach some of our classes here years ago, but he didn't speak English very well, so he was very embarrassed about his accent, so he didn't feel comfortable coming to But that was the last time we had a commercial wine in Walla Walla Valley. Now after that, the first one began. In 1977, with Gary and Nancy Figgins of Leonetti Settlers. Then the family name of Leonetti came from Gary's mother's side of the family. She's a Leonette. So it was named after her family. And her family is from Casenza, Italy. And they're Calabrasians. And they're farmers. Every Italian is a white. Every Italian. So if you study Italian, you've discovered that there is not a word for winemaking or winemaker in Italian. None whatsoever. And the reason for that is you make wine if you are an Italian, period. <clears throat> so if you're an Italian, you make wine. That's how they perceive it. That's how they believe it. Gary worked at Continental Camp as a tool maker. Nancy, Nancy would uh, take in children and had and, and cared for them during the day. And then later she got a job as a retail salesperson at Falkenberg's Jewelry on Main Street. They made about Fifteen thousand dollars a year, and they had two children, Amy and Kristen. And their whole goal was to hopefully get them grown up and through college. That was their total goal to do. Gary, as a hobby, made one. He made wine from anything that would ferment. He made wine even from figs, strawberries, cherries, peaches, raspberries, and some from grapes. And he practiced doing that for a while. And in 1977, he decided to bomb the wine at their house. And the, the winery was located in the basement. 
And so they released their first three ones in 1977. What is your guess of what they were? Speak up. You can do it. Black friends must drive. I don't know. Close, but no cigar. Give me a hint. They were all whites. You better write it down because this is history. Riesling was one. Riesling was one. He grew it. Your Verstermeer was two. He grew it. Merlot Blanc was three. He grew it. And I had the great fortune of being able to taste all of those. They were wonderful, luscious, delicious, bright, balanced. Then in 1978, he made his first Cabernet Sauvignon as a commercial wine. And so what he did was, he and Nancy just decided they would send a bottle or two to the wine and spirits guide and have them evaluate so we can get some feedback. He sold it for $20 a bottle. Came back, it was chosen as the best Cabernet Sauvignon in America in 1981. Uh, it was 81. So everyone wanted that one. So he was very, very fortunate that he hit Pater right away. The Gallo brothers sent their secretary up here in a Learjet to get a case of that one. So they sent her up. She went downtown, got a telephone directory and found out, ah, Leonetti. So she called the Leonetti number. The person answering the phone only spoke Italian. But the address was in Poland. So she drove out, and Uncle Will and Uncle George were there. And they were kind of in their late 80s. And they made, they made homemade wine, and they offered it to them. <clears throat> They did not understand what she was doing, and she did not understand about reviewing wine and getting awards and all of that. They spoke very, very broken English. So she didn't have any success there. Then she went back to Main Street. There was a delicatessen there and went in and finally was able to assemble a case of wine, put it on the Learjet and went on. Never met Gary, never met Nancy, never went to the wine, which was on School Avenue in those days. Now it's on School Avenue as well as Square Avenue. They own the fifth oldest continuously operated winery in Washington. The fifth oldest. He is the Dean of Wine. If there is a word better than icon, apply it. They only opened once a year, and it was the first weekend in May. And they still follow that same pattern. Today, all of their wines are sold for next year. So you are, if you have purchased wine, you're allowed to come during their open house, first weekend in May. You can bring one guest with you. If you have two, one of them has to stay outside the property. Because they don't have that much wine. 
but you can go in and have a taste. So, I'll, so 22 to 2300 people on the first weekend in May come to Walla Walla to pick up their wine at Leonid. What's the today? Well, the most famous bottle that he that he makes is called Reserve. It's 140 dollars. Cabernet Sauvignon is usually 90. Merlot is around 80. And the San Giovese is 65 to 70. But you can walk outside the property and there'll be people out there that will buy the wine <laughs> at a much higher price. <laughs> at a much higher price. They've had six wines in the top 100 the world chosen by Wine Spectator magazine. And the 1978 Cabernet Sauvignon came from Sagemore Vineyards, which was planted in 1972. Glock 3. Most famous Cabernet Glock in Washington. There are people that would die for a ton of grapes from Block 3. And Sagemore Vineyards has been a very good friend of the wine center and the winery and has donated wine grapes to us. And we've made some <coughs> great wines. And you'll probably have the same opportunity. The second one was Seven Hills, 1980. And this vineyard was planted, and it's probably the most famous vineyard in the Walla Walla ABAs. In 1981, Woodward Canyon, Darcy and Rick Small started Woodward Canyon Winery. Rick was a very, very dear and close friend of Gary. They, they served in the National Guard together and the reserves together. And one of the things they did when they were bored to death was to taste wines. Rick was making good wines, and he was specializing in Chardonnays and Cabernet Sauvignon. Where Gary was focusing on Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon. And then he started to grow all of the six red noble Bordeaux varieties. And so Frida will ask you that on Monday what they are. And he focused on that. And those are the grapes that go in the reserva of mayonnaise. And the proportions and the mixture all has to do with Gary's palate. Rick graduated from WSU, has a degree in agriculture. The most important title for Rick Small is not winemaker, but viticulturist. Because he believes that it's the viticulturist that make the wine. So he is not what scientists would say, a viticulturist, he says, I am a wine farmer. I'm a wine farmer. He operates on the philosophy that 80 points from the wine spectator comes from the vineyard. 20 points comes from the facility and the barrels and how well it is cared for and sanitized. You know that sanitation will work. And 10 points comes from the wine maker. Now remember, the wine maker can Elevate the scores. <laughs> <laughs> and so the task of the winemaker then is not to screw it up. Not to screw up what the viticulture and the wine farmer has done, but to preserve the elegance of the grapes when they come in. And that's going to be a job that you're going to have to learn this year. 1981, Winrow Vineyard was, uh, was planted, and it was just recently purchased over the last few years by the 
Pascales, and they have created a winery called Tero, T-E-R-O, and they make wine, a Cabernet, 100% Cabernet from Windrow Vineyard to delicious, delicious vineyard. Marvelous, wonderful. Get some. A3 La Col 41 was started, and in La Col 41 it was started by Gene, sorry, and Baker Ferguson. Gene was a teacher and a chemist, and she was the one that actually made the wine. And I believe that Gene was the first woman commercial winemaker in Washington, in modern times. Baker Ferguson was a professor of economics at Whitman and the president of Baker Boyer Bank, the oldest bank in the Northwest. And every one of his econ students would have to come to his office at the bank one hour every semester to talk with him about life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He wanted to make astonishing Malau and Semillon. He wanted a winery that would focus on those two varietals. And that's what he did. That's what Gene did with him. And uh, they made some incredibly award-winning Merlots and Semillons. And the Col 41 now has been taken over by their daughter, Megan Club, who's the president of Megan Warrior Bank, <coughs> her husband, Martin Club. And make great ones. Make very great ones. Waterbrook was started in 84 by Eric and Janet Rendall. And uh, the winery uh, in 2001, I believe, was purchased by Precept. So it's the major star in the crown of Precept. I think Precept has about 28, 29, 30 different brands now. In 1985, Brisket Ridge Winery was started by Jack and Helen Durham. And Jack retired from the Navy and bought a little place up here in Dixie, planted some commercial <coughs> here along with his wife Helen, and made some commercial meter over about two years. And then he died in the vineyard. He had cancer, and so every day he would crawl around out in the vineyard, prune it, take good care of it, manage it. And he says, the place I want to die is here. And so that's exactly what happened. Helen then took over and um, asked another winemaker to come and make the wine for them. And that was Rusty Piggins, Gary Piggins' youngest brother. And he attempted to try to revive it, but it didn't work. And so that eventually, that's the first winery that evaporated since Blue Mountain Cellars out in the middle of the In 1988, Patrick Paul was created by Mike and Teresa Paul on School Avenue across from Leonetics. Uh, three years ago, Patrick Paul, we lost him. A brain tumor and, and he, could, he didn't survive the surgery. So they had conquered grapes there. So the first wine they made was conquered grape wine. And there was a lot of people in Washington that loved his wines. They would come down and buy them, and then finally he would take Concord and Merlot, put them together. And then he finally would do a little Merlot and Concord and Franc together. And so it's a very successful little tiny boutique winery on School Avenue and it is no longer in existence anymore. Seven Hills Winery was started in 1988 by Casey and Vicki McClellan. Casey McClellan was the son of James McClellan, who planted Seven Hills Vineyard. And there was a partnership with another gentleman by the name of Hendricks, Jim Hendricks. They were both physicians, and they were both in 
St. Mary's. They had two sons. They had Scott McClellan, Scott Hendricks, who was a radio station broadcaster. And Casey. And Casey was a pharmacist, graduated from the University of Washington. Applied for the first Wine Spectator Scholarship to Davis and got it. So he was the first university trained winemaker in Walla Walla. Casey McClellan. And he still practices pharmacy to maintain his license every month. And they're located inside the White House Crawford Restaurant building. Make great wines. And now specializes in making wines from Seven Hills Wine Group. In 1991, Pepper Vineyard was <coughs> just 10 acres, and then they expanded it later. And this was done by Norm McKibben and Company. Then in 1994, Canoe Ridge was started by the Shalom Group, which was a group of investors, and there were 26 of them here in Walla Walla that were investors in the Shalom Group, and they created Canoe Ridge, and it was bonded in 94. John Abbott was the winemaker, and then John left there in about 96 and went to put a bay hobby. And then Pepper Bridge was sold. And then the 26 investors went and met in a room over a glass of wine and created Forge and Wine Wine, which today now has over 50 shareholders. Forty and I started at the Walla Walla Ventures in 1995. And the first year that I made wine was in 1977 in Walla So I, this is my 37th vintage. So if you like them, if you don't like the way I look after 37 years, you're going to look this way. Thank you. And our winery is up on Milk Creek. Glen Fiona was started in 1995, it still exists. And it was started by uh, uh, Tony Weeks, Rusty Higgins, and it was sold to Silverdale Wine. No longer is central here. And in 97, Cayuse and Weinecker and Bunchgrass were started. 1997, Seven Hill was expanded to 200 acres. And that particular vineyard now is owned by principally three people. Marty Club, Eric Higgins, Norm McKinnon. In 98, Don Sellers was started with Eric Don, the winemaker. And then Pepper Brent was started. Russell Creek was started by Larry Prevershane. Larry Prevershane was a funeral director. And he had a homemade wine, and he'd come over and give you a bottle of wine and had a label on it that said, Digger. <laughs> Digger. Tamarack was started by Ron Coleman. Whitman Cellars had a number of different owners over time, and that's gone. Yellow Hawk was started by a pharmacist, and that's no longer in existence. But they specialize in Italians. Italian so here we are. 1999, Calden. Mark Calden was a pharmacist at this wine. It used to be out at the airport. It's closed today. It had a lot of financial difficulties. Carla Quinn was started in Tushi. 
you are a reader of the Harlequin book series, which is these romance novels. There's a lot of legs, breasts, things in those novels, named after that. They're now in Pipe Street Place Market, where they're located. Eisenhower was started, Brett Eisenhower, a pharmacist. Uh, he only sells his wine and his wine. No, no other place. He doesn't wholesale wine. He does only. Hey, Vendors then was started by Charles Smith. Big featured piece in the current Spectator about his life, and of which I've been a part of and an observer of. He is the best wine marketer probably in the United States. Doesn't make wine. Greatest winemaker in But he knows people who make good wine and he can go and buy it. So he has lots of different brands. Spring Valley was started by the Derbies uh, in 1999. Wall Wall Vintners made its first two wines. Uh, and uh, the second one they made for them was ranked number 16 in Wine Spectator Top 100. And then eventually it was purchased by Something Show. The winery as well as the vineyard. And in addition to Spring Valley, they own North Star. Three Rivers was started in 99. Beauty was started in 2000. El Mirador was started. Five Star was started by a graduate of a community college, both in carpentry and in winemaking. Zabaya was started. Stephenson is still in existence, but thinking of that moving. Lake Hoang Vineyard was planted in, two, in, uh, in 2000. It's 240 acres. It's a partnership between Norm McKibben and Mike Murr, M U R R. This particular center was started and founded in 2000. And then after that, all kinds of explosions in took place. Beha, Amavi, Basil, Bergman Lane, Berenson, Cougar Crest. Cougar Crest, there's a pharmacist in Cougar Crest too. Forgeron was started principally by those 26 core investors and they picked up some additional ones over time. So you can buy into that wine right now. Only cost you about 50 grand. Erlinger is, uh, was started in 2001. They have a small vineyard. They make some good wines. Nicholas Call was started then by a developer from Nebraska, from uh, Nevada. One to make some of the very best Cabernet Sauvignons in America. Came up, threw a lot of money at all of that. Had a successful facility, a great vineyard, and all of that that went bankrupt. Didn't make it. Couldn't do it. Pat Creek has been bought and sold a couple times. Rulo is owned by a retired anesthesiologist and pediatrician, Kurt Schlicker. What a name, Kurt Schlicker. <laughs> Makes wonderful wines. If you follow Sabrina, and Tim Donahue and their winemaking practices, they're very much like the ones that Kurt Schlicker did. Highly sterile wines. Then we have in 2002 for Ball Walla, we have Long Shadows, which has about 10 different brands that makes wines for them, but all of them are. And then Morrison Lane, 
which was started by Zine and Bertie. Of course. And they're no longer associated with it anymore. The sun has taken over. Zappalil, which is on this particular list, has converted into a nightclub on Main Street. They usually only serve their wines in that nightclub. No other ethanol was available. <laughs> so now you can get beer in other people's wines and cocktails as well. We started teaching vineyard here in 2002. So if anyone asks you about the length and how old this vineyard is, 2002, Jess Poppick, of course, is a viticulturist. And then 2003, we've got Dusted Valley, Precept, Paul Piano, Water. And then we opened the, uh, the winery here in 2003. We made the wine up at Walla Walla Winters. We loaned them our winery. There's two classes. Made some good wines. There's still some down in the cellar here. At the end of so there were 50 plus wineries that were bonded from 77 to 2000. So there's 175 real or virtual wineries here now. I would say probably by the end of this year, probably 200. Because you have to figure out there's, there's a lot of different wineries. There's a lot of wineries that are just virtual. They don't make any wine. They buy juice. There are state wineries that have their own vineyards and make their own wine. They grow, farm the wine as well as make it. And there's some wineries that, that source their grapes from other places and do very, very good jobs and make great wine. So you have a choice of all three of them if you want to. You have in front of you five glasses. And they're from the oldest wineries in Wall. And we have this little peeping dish right there to capture the aroma. So what you probably want to try to do is you want to kind of thrash the wine a little bit, then snip it, because the nose is very, very important in wine tasting. So if you have a cold, you can't taste wine well at all. And you have a little blue spit cup there for spitting. Then what you may want to do then is to make sure that you, after you remove this and the alcohol is evaporating a little bit, then you continue to thrash this a little bit. Look at the color. Is there anything floating? Any debris in it? Any sediment floating around, any <coughs> cork floating around, that gives you some idea about the quality of the wine you're about to taste. Does it smell like a wet diaper? A used <coughs> okay. If you if you smell that, then you have a problem. Okay, after you do that, the first thing you want to do is put a little bit of wine in your mouth and thrash it around in your mouth without spitting. There you go. Now you've conditioned your palate. It's very important to do that. So one of the things you have to prepare for these tasting classes is you have aftershave, no. Perfume, no. Lipstick, no. Brush your teeth, no. Dry brush, yes. Water pick, yes. No toothpaste. No gum. No lifesavers. 
no sunny side alfalfa. <laughs> Got it? All right. This is the oldest winery wine. 2011 Reserve. Leonette. $140 a bottle. A couple dollars just in your glass. Okay? who comes to Walla Walla to make wine wants to be the next Leonette. And that's been the way it has been for the last 40 years or so. And so this is the standard. This is the industry standard for great red wines in Washington. So what you want to try to do is strive to make one this good. Do you know what the blend is on this? Yeah. Nope, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to just look it up. 2011. The 2000, this got a, a score of 94 from the advocate. The 2010, if you're fortunate enough to get, get a sip of that, that got 100. <coughs> and this winery now is run by Amy Thiggins, daughter, CEO of Wine Marketing for Leonidas, and Christopher Figgins, Director of Wine Making. Brother and sister. Both are CEOs. Both are ahead of the company. Both have equal jobs. Both have equal salaries. The difference is Christopher is also the winemaker for Doubleback, which is a winery owned by Drew the Bloodsoul. And he also is the winemaker owner of Figgins Family. And he's also the owner of a cattle company, Lostein Cattle Company. He also is the winemaker for a winery that he owns and operates in Willamette Valley called Toil. Like a working pool. Reserve. Oldest winery in Walla Walla. Okay, the next one is Rick and Darcy Smalls River Canyon Reserve. This comes also from their estate. Now remember, you've also conditioned your your palate, so you don't have to do any scrubbing out of your. You can just now begin to sniff it, sniff it, look at the color, compare it with the Leonetti. And this is a this is a blend also. Ready? Draw lots of air into your mouth. Lots of air. 41% Merlot. 31% Petit Verdot. 14% Cabernet Franc. 14% Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a Bordeaux blend. It has just four of the Bordeaux Red Noble grapes. What was the message again? This one's 2010. I think it's about $85. Think about that. Cheers. 
you want to see how much alcohol there is in this wine, blow it. And then look at the tears as it drips down the side of the glass. That's alcohol. Rick Small, second oldest experienced winemaker in Walla Walla. Makes fantastic wine. Specializes in making estate vineyard wines and thinks of himself as a viticulturist. 2010. When Gary, Gary Figgins went to Walla Walla Community College and graduated, what do you think his major was? No. Good, good idea. No. Irrigation. Who? Irrigation. No. Auto mechanic. Auto mechanic. Remember, he's a tool. <coughs> tool man. Auto mechanic. So all of the vehicles that are owned and operated by Vianetti Sellers, tractors, cars, trucks, are all serviced at Vianetti Sellers. <laughs> he also has some special vehicles in his collection. Okay, Baker and Gene Ferguson, LeCole 41, is the next winery, wine and winery is represented here. This is Perigee. This is, these grapes came from the Seven Hills Vineyard and this particular plot is owned by Marty and Megan Club. And it, here's the percentage, 2011, 60% Cabernet, 20% Merlot, 10% Cabernet Franc, 6% Malbec, and 4% Petit Verdot. Has five of the Red Nobles. Great wine. $75. The styles are different. The blends are different. I found the blend of the Leonetti. Did you? Yeah, I think I found some. Merlot and? Uh, no, it's 65 cab, 21 Merlot, 7 deep Merlot, and 7 cab. Yeah, they tend to put their tech sheets online. Did you find it from their website? Now, so far we've had wines that are made by self-taught winemakers. And it was this group that I went to when I did the survey to see if there was an interest in building and creating the Center for Analogy and Viticulture. And I asked them, do we need it? They said, yes, definitely. Will you help us? Yes, definitely. And so these are the principles, and they're still dear friends of this center, and give money, and scholarships, and grants. So you also have to think of them as kind of mentors, people that are a part of your life here. 
done a great job. And they, they supported me for the 12 years that I was associated with this. Uh, for example, Baker Ferguson's fund that gave us that money we used to build the new vineyard of, of the collection of varietals that we have there. So that's where the that's where I got the money to do that. You didn't know that. And so that's where that came from. So when you go out there and you're picking Marsan, Rusan, Tempranillo, Barbera, Aligote. And Aligote. When you're picking that, think about Gene, it's Baker and Gene Ferguson. They provided the dough for us to get those plants and put in all that stuff. Cool people. Okay, the next oldest is Seven Hills. This has been made by a professionally trained university winemaker. Pharmacist. I think I poured um, your Woodward Canyon next. We did Woodward. Oh, oh I'm, I'm so sorry. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> okay, we did. Okay, now we're on the McClellan Estate Vineyard, which used to be a part of Seven Hills. This was set aside and dedicated to Casey and Mickey. And this is Petit Verdot, 100%. Not a lot of that is made 100% anywhere in the world, but some is made here. And so Casey also grows this. And they too give money for a scholarship here. So one of you may have it. And maybe one of you have the Leonetti's or more. Okay, so this is the Tiber Dough. This the Petita dough grapes, the bunch is about as big as your fist. The berries are very, very, very tiny. And you don't, you don't get a lot of juice. Here. You get a lot of flavor. And this particular grape is called a seasoning grape. We use it to season other ones. So it's not often you get 100%. Here's to <laughs> Always inky. Black inky. It requires a lot of time. In the bottle as well as the, uh, the barrel. This is 2012. Now the final one, uh, Gordy Veneri and Bill von Metzger and I made, this is a, a state Syrah. Now what I recommend you do is go back and taste the Leonetti's first before you do the Syrah because the, the petite Verdot is so intense, it's still on your palate. And, and so this Syrah is going to taste really thin. Taste that. Get that in your mouth. Now try the Syrah. smokiness in the, in the aroma. The vineyards that are up there will probably be eventually their own ABN. In 
your lifetime, maybe not mine, but in your lifetime, that will be its own ABA. It will be called Mill Creek ABA. Leonetti's is up there. Wall Wall Bitters is up there. <coughs> Den Hode and Dunham are up there. Okay, Dunham's part of the Den Hode. There. Now, these wines here are the standards for Wall Wall. They're the standards. So when people come here and want to taste varietals like the ones we just tasted, they usually go to these places and taste them to learn about what is the standard here. Now there's only one other standard that's being evolving here and that's the one that Christoph Baron was putting together because he's a biodynamic farmer and viticulture. <coughs> and his wines are very, very different and are very, very distinctive. But they're not the Walla Walla standard, they're the Cayuse standard. Cayuse standard. I have run out of your time. I have imposed on you more than necessary. But this might give you just a touch of the history of what has been gone on before you. And we really want you to know about the history because we want you to take the history and put it in your brain and continue it and keep it as rich and as wonderful as it has been here. This is the place to be. And this is the place to be educated if you want to know about winemaking and vinegar. Tim, Jeff, and Sabrina are the very best team that I know of. I don't have, I didn't have the great fortune that you had to be taught by these people. And that's the reason why we created this, so that you will have this opportunity. I hope to see you again this year somewhere, somewhere. Come to Walla Walla Vendors. Use me if you can. But I love that you're here. Study fucking hard. <laughs> <laughs>